Go ahead and get started this evening with our song service. If you're visiting with us, we are glad to have you here. And if you would please fill out an attendance card and send that towards the center aisle at some point this evening, we would appreciate that. If you'd go ahead and take out a book, we're going to go ahead and start with number 247. Number 247. I want to be a soul winner for Jesus every day. He does so much for me. I want to aid the lost and to leave his erring way and be from bondage free. A soul winner for Jesus, a soul winner for Jesus. Oh, let me be each day. A soul winner for Jesus, a soul winner for Jesus. He's done so much for me. I want to be a soul winner and bring the lost to Christ, that they His grace may know. I want to live for Christ ever and do His blessed will, because He loves me so. A soul winner for Jesus, a soul. Winner for Jesus, oh, let me be each day. <coughs> winner for Jesus, a soul. Winner for Jesus, he's done so much for me. I want to be a soul when I tell Jesus calls for me to lay my burdens down. I want to hear him say, servant, you've gathered many sheep, receive a shining crown. A soul winner for Jesus, a soul winner for Jesus, oh, let me be each day. A soul winner for Jesus, a soul winner for Jesus, he's done so much for me. Go ahead and sing number 676. 676. After this, we'll have our prayer and scripture reading. <clears throat> It only takes a spark to get a fire going, and soon all those around can warm up in his slowing. That's how it is with God's love. Once you've experienced it, you spread His love to everyone. You want to pass it on. What a wondrous time is spring when all the trees are budding. The birds begin to sing, the flowers begin to bloom. In. That's how it is with God's love. Once you've experienced it, you want to see 
morning is fresh like spring. You want to pass it on. I wish for you, my friend, this happiness that I found. You can depend on him. It matters not where you're bound. I'll shout it from the mountain top. I want my world to know the Lord of love has come to me. I want to pass it on. Now, how prayer and scripture reading. Go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this beautiful day and its witness of, your, of the glory of your creation. It's a perfect evidence that this world is not by happenstance, but by your creation and your plan. We're thankful, Father, for our blessings, both physical and spiritual. We're thankful for the word and your instruction for our lives. We're not left in the dark. We have a guide. We have instructions, and we have a purpose to be your children, that we might have a home with you one day. Father, tomorrow our, our nation observes a, a day to recognize those who gave their lives in service to the country. And we, Father, have been given a memorial that we observed this morning. It was a recognition of a life given in service to all of us. But more than that, beyond just the service was the conquering of death and the, the opportunity that holds for each of us to be your children, to live the lives you'd ask us to live, and to have a home with you one day in heaven. Father, we'd ask you to be with those who are ill. Uh, if it be your will that your, your hand would be upon them, that they would re uh, enjoy a better portion of health, they might return with us and enjoy the fellowship and strength that we gain from spending our time together with fellow Christians. Please be with those who are caring for them. Give them wisdom in the, the treatments that they provide, patience and love in the times that they spend with them. Father, be with those who might be suffering the loss of loved ones. Give them the, the comfort that only you can, but help us to see the opportunities you place before us to lighten their burdens. Help us to have the courage to do what we can for them. Father, be with Roger this evening as he brings our lesson. Help him remember the things he studied and prepared. Help us to be good students, attentive, and comparing it to your word and finding your truths, committing them to our hearts, and doing our best to live by them. We're so thankful for your son, his willingness to sacrifice on our behalf, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Scripture is 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verses 1 through 7. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You therefore must endure hardships as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please who, will, who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. If you'd like to go ahead and mark the song after the lesson, that will be number 595. Number 595. <clears throat> Then we'll go ahead and sing number 225, number 225, and if you're able to, please stand with me. <clears throat> no. 
There were ninety and nine that safely lay in the shelter of the fold. But one was out on the hills away, far off from the gates of gold. Away on the mountains, wild and bare, away from the tender shepherd's care, away from the tender shepherd's care. Lord, thou hast here thy ninety and nine, are they not enough for thee? But the shepherd made answer, this of mine has wandered away from me. And although the road be rough and steep, I go to the desert to find my sheep. I go to the desert to find my sheep. But none of the ransom ever knew how deep were the waters cross. Nor how dark was the night that the Lord passed through, and we found his sheep that was lost. Far out in the desert he heard his cry, T'was sick and helpless and ready to die. T'was sick and helpless and ready to die. Lord, winds are those blood drops all the way that moss out the mountain's track. They were shed for one who had gone astray, and the shepherd could bring him back. Lord, winds are thy hands so rent and torn, that pierce to night by many a thorn, that pierce to night by many a thorn. But all through the mountains, thunder, river, and up from the rocky steep, there arose the glad cry to the gates of heaven, Rejoice, I have found my sheep. And the angels echoed around the throne, Rejoice, for the Lord brings back his own. Rejoice, for the Lord brings back his own. Please see I have not a clue what's wrong with our PowerPoint tonight. But I saw two fellows that ought to know, and they couldn't fix it, so I'm not about to do anything with it. I'm assuming that the update that came this past week has had some impact on how the PowerPoint is working. Don't understand it. But. If you can't see everything, ain't my fault, because I can see it and it looks fine from where I stand. You'll just have to take my word for it. I notice the halls are with us tonight. Did you have a good vacation, Caitlin? Good. Glad you're back. Graduation was this afternoon. I know some of you were at that, but uh, last year Marietta High School changed its practice and went from a six o'clock graduation to a three o'clock graduation, which in my judgment makes a lot more sense than uh, what they had done for years. So we're glad you were able to be at graduation and uh, return tonight. I know this is Memorial Day weekend 
and there are a number of folks out of town and camping. So we're glad you're here, and I trust that our time together uh, will be beneficial. How can I help the church grow? I would hope that that's a question all of us are vitally interested in answering from a biblical perspective. If you were following along as Paul shared our text tonight, I think you got a good idea of what God expects. The gospel is good news. What do you do with good news? You share it. You tell others what you have learned. I have on occasion mentioned that if someone were standing on the corner of 3rd and Putnam handing out $100 bills to everybody that passed by, one per person, you would get yours and immediately you would call or text the people in your life that mean something to you and pass along the good news. That's just human nature. I don't know that I would walk or drive to that corner for $100. I can tell you right now, I wouldn't stand in line very long for it. When I'm on a corner and there are two gas stations selling gas and one is cheaper, but the lines are long, I'm going to go to the more expensive station because I value my time. And I'm not certain for $100 I'd stand in line anywhere. But I know a lot of people who would, and that's good news to be shared. What about the gospel, the story of Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection, the fundamental facts of that story, or the demands of the gospel, faith, repentance, and baptism, and certainly the promises, forgiveness of sin, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and the promise of eternal life. These are things that we ought not keep to ourselves. And so Paul charged Timothy, the things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. The sad reality is that we have become in many ways, a people who believe that others can do what God is depending on us to do. We hire a preacher, and he can do the preaching and teaching. Any preacher worth his salt will never work for a church. Preachers work for the Lord, and the church is given the privilege of supporting them. And I say that in all seriousness. And we are co-laborers and fellow ministers. Everyone in Jesus Christ is to be a servant. That's what the word minister really means. And if we follow his example, we accept our responsibility. And I acknowledge that not everyone can stand in a pulpit and deliver a message like this or one better, which not, uh, in my judgment, would be all that difficult. But half of you are prohibited by Scripture from doing that. And the other half, by choice, chooses not to by and large. But the reality is there are still responsibilities that fall on all of us if the church is going to grow. And I will tell you, it's not going to grow without effort. And it's not going to grow without time. When we share the gospel, we are essentially planting seed. The Word of God is the seed, Luke 8, 11. It's planted in soil, the hearts of men. And not all soil is the same. Some is rocky. Some is filled with thorns and briars and weeds. Some's hard and the seed can't even penetrate. But some's good, and when the seed is sown in the good soil, it produces abundantly. And we are to be seed sowers. But when you sow seed, does it immediately produce fruit? I remember vividly when our children were very young, we were living in the country, planted a garden the next day, Adam wanted to go harvest the fruit. 
He just assumed if we put the seed in the ground one day, we ought to be picking beans and husking corn the next. But you know as well as I do, that's not the way it works. Now, he was only five at the time, so cut him a little slack. But the word's the same way. We sow it in the heart, the soil, and over time, if the soil is good, it will germinate, grow, and eventually produce fruit, sometimes an abundant crop, and we have to be patient. I'm told that James Garfield, when he was the president of Hiram College, was approached by a rather well-to-do gentleman with a request. My son really isn't able. He doesn't have the time to go through a four-year education. Can't you give him something that's quicker and get him in and out so he can get on his way and engaged in business? And according to the story, Garfield replied, if you want to grow an oak, it takes 80 years. If you want to grow a squash, it takes two months. And what you want for your boy is not to be a squash, but an oak. And you can't hurry it up. But that's really what people want to do all the time. They want everything, and they want it yesterday. We like instant pudding. You do. You like it because you can have it in a hurry. I started to say you like instant mashed potatoes, but I know you don't. So not everything that's instant is good, is it? But we're still in a hurry, though there are only two real rushes in this assembly tonight. And you get that, I hope. Brad is grinning. He does. But we're all in a rush. We want it. We don't want it now. We want it yesterday. And it doesn't work that way. And it certainly doesn't work that way in relationship to growing the church, saving souls. When you look at the New Testament church, what do you see? You see, first and foremost, members who possess a spirit of love, unity, and cooperation who are willing to work together to accomplish a common end. In Acts chapter 4, verse 32, it is said of those early saints, they were of one heart and one soul. That singleness of purpose is essential to growing a church. You see, secondly, in regard to the membership, that it was composed of men, and in particular in relationship to leadership, leaders of character. There is not a single hint of scandal attached to the names of Peter and Paul and James and John and others that we could list. These are folks who took their relationship with Christ seriously. They had the imprint of the Master upon their hearts, and it was apparent. When Peter and John were arrested early in Acts 3 and 4, they made their defense before the Jewish High Council, the Sanhedrin, and it was immediately recognized that though they were uneducated men, they had been with Jesus. If we want to see the church grow, our community has to see in us the imprint of the master. That's precisely what Paul had in mind in Galatians chapter 2 when he said, It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The membership, thirdly, had a willingness to work. Do you know early on, shortly after the establishment of the church in Acts chapter 2, these early disciples had so labored and sown the seed that they were accused of filling the whole city with the name or doctrine of Jesus Christ. And they did it without print, radio, television, Twitter, or Facebook. They did it because they believed in their work. And they set out to do what they could. It's always struck me as insightful. Acts chapter 8, following the death of Stephen, the, the next chapter, 
chapter 8, Stephen's death is in chapter 7, begins with an acknowledgement that persecution came on the church in Jerusalem, and so the saints fled in all directions. But it says, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. And you may be thinking, well, that was Peter and James and John and, and others of the twelve. No, not at all. If you read the text carefully, the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. These were just ordinary folks like us who had an extraordinary message to share and a word a willingness to share it because they had a mind to work. Look at the message, secondly, when you think about the rapid growth of, of the early church. What do you know about it? Well, you know first and foremost that these are not folks who failed to walk the talk. These are people who knew what Jesus demanded, and they lived it every day. They walked their talk. People saw them and they saw a reflection of him. And what they advocated, they first practiced. There was no hypocrisy. Just a faithful following in the footsteps of the master. For us to be effective in sowing the seed, we must first live it obey it ourselves. They did, so must we. Because unless we live it, we cannot effectively advocate it. So they lived it, and then they preached it faithfully. They were told, Peter and John, and then the twelve, you are not to make any mention of him in this city. We've had enough. You've got to stop. And what did they do? They went home and prayed for greater boldness that they might preach the message of Jesus. Acts chapter 4, verse 20. Chapter 5, verse 29. You see, the saints cannot be silenced when they truly are God's people. Even when you get discouraged and determine, I'm done. Nobody's listening. Why do I bother? If you are truly what you ought to be, you will find it impossible to be quiet. Just like Jeremiah of old, his word ought to burn within your heart like a burning fire. And you will grow weary with forbearing and cannot help but speak. That was the early church. You want to understand how they grew understand their relationship to the message they advocated, how they lived it, and how they faithfully taught it, and how they defended it fearlessly. They were not going to be silenced when told not to speak or teach anymore in the name of Jesus. Their response was, we've got to obey God, not men. When you have to choose between following God and following the masses, always follow God. He will take you where you want to go. And when you join in with the crowd, when you go the way of the majority, you're going to regret it eternally. Let me stop for a moment and remind you, as a Christian, you are always going to be in the minority. They were, we are. But we have the truth. We ought to live it. We ought to teach it. We ought to defend it fearlessly. And what about their mission? What was the church all about? Now, if you pay much attention to what's going on in the religious world today, it's about numbers, attendance, and contribution, neither of which is highlighted in the Word of God. That was not the issue. The issue was telling lost men of the Savior the way, the truth, and the life. And that definite article, the, is extremely important. You see, in modern perception, Jesus is not the way, the truth, and life. He is a way, he is a truth, and he's a life, but there are others 
Find the one that appeals to you and you will be fine. They did not embrace that thinking, nor should the church today. If we're going to be effective and the church is going to grow, we have to understand our mission. And the mission is quite simple. We, like they, have a divine commission to take the gospel into all the world. Now, our world may be relatively small. You may think, well, do I need to go around the globe in order to share the message and fulfill the mission? No, actually, you need to do it in your home, in your workplace, in your community, even at school. That's your mission field. Preach the gospel to every creature. There is someone in this community that you can reach if you will accept your mission as these early disciples did. You see, they took it seriously. So that Paul could write in Colossians 1.26 that he had preached the gospel to every creature under heaven whereof he said, I, Paul, had been made a minister. See, that's the pattern that we're to follow. Everyone you meet, you ought to make an effort to introduce to Jesus Christ. I don't want you inviting people to come here, Roger, because that's not why we're here. Come hear the gospel. Come worship God in spirit and in truth. Come be exposed to the will of the Master, the sacrifice of the Savior, and the hope that comes only through Jesus. You can do that if you're like these early saints and take your mission seriously. But they, they believed, finally, in regard to the mission, in the worth of every soul. I believe that there are times when we write people off without ever making an effort. Well, they're just not going to be interested uh, they don't dress the way we do. They don't have our values. They're, we're, we're just going to be spinning our tires, as we say. You just never know, though, who will be receptive to truth, nor do we know when. But every soul matters to the Master. Every soul ought to be precious to us. No one is beyond the reach of God's grace when they open their heart to the gospel. So in relationship to the growth of the New Testament church, the membership, the message, the mission, all need to be highlighted. But let me go a step further and give you a formula that I believe will work every time. If we want to win souls to Christ, we must play. <laughs> You're thinking, what do you mean by that? Well, it's an acrostic. I mean, we ought to be praying seriously about souls. We ought to pray without ceasing that God can use us to reach lost men and women. And the matters that truly matter are of a spiritual nature. I'm not opposed to praying that sick people will get well, that folks who have lost their jobs can get another job. All of that is important. But there are matters that matter even more. When you look at Paul's prayer for the saints at Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 3, 14 through 21, his prayer is that they might be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ would dwell in their hearts, that they would be rooted and grounded in love and able to comprehend with all the saints the height and depth and length and breadth and to know the love of Christ that passes knowledge. When was the last time you prayed a prayer like that and then set out to see it fulfilled? Pray for the lost, that they will come to know the love of Christ, that they will be filled with a knowledge of his word, that they will be moved by the power of that word to obey his gospel. Live every day. For the master. In Philippians 1 verse 27, I will cite this in the King James because it's what I remember. Only let your conversation be that which becometh the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
The word conversation, when the King James Version was done, meant conduct. We use this word in an entirely different way today. So modern translations urge us to let our conduct be that which the gospel dictates. And when is this to be the case? Paul said that whether present or absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Do you know people that act one way when they're with Christians and act an entirely different way when they're not? I'll go a step further. Do you know people that act one way in the presence of the preacher and act a different way with everybody else? I hope not. And I certainly hope you're not like that. Because if we are going to help the church grow, we've got to live our faith consistently. I grew up in a sheltered environment. I didn't know that Christians did not behave in a Christian way until I got out in the world and I saw my spiritual family outside of a setting like this. I just couldn't believe that Christians would use the kind of language I was hearing Christians use. They would tell the kinds of stories. They'd do the kinds of things that are incompatible with the Christian profession. And then we wonder why we can't be effective and people are not listening. They are not going to listen if we don't first live our message. Isn't that what we said about the early church? They walk the talk. So must we. And to do that, we've got to avoid certain things in life that are incompatible with our profession. There are books and magazines and movies and TV shows that just are not compatible with our faith in Jesus Christ. That makes us odd, different. It subjects us sometimes to ridicule. No, we don't drink. We don't smoke, we don't do drugs, we don't carouse all hours of the night out with the world. Not because we think we're better than everybody else, but because we know we need to be better than we were. In our life, I'd be patterned after the life of the Lord. He left us an example, Peter said, that we should follow in his step. Can you see Jesus doing the things that the world routinely does? And the answer is obviously no. Then those are the things that we ought not do either. Abstain from every appearance of evil. And folks, that doesn't mean that we get as close to sin as we can without stepping across the line, so to speak. What it advocates for is our moving back and staying as far from those things that are foreign to the Christian profession as we possibly can. And if we're unwilling to do that, we're not going to be effective in helping the church grow. And then finally, we've got to yearn for the church to grow and souls to be saved. Next Sunday, the Lord willing, we're going to spend the morning and the evening messages from Romans chapter 10. Paul said, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. If you had to summarize in a few words tonight your heart's desire, would you echo the sentiments of Paul? Are you really focused on the salvation of souls? And what is more important than winning someone to Jesus? Be it Andrew, who went out and found his brother and said, we've, we've met the Messiah. Come and meet him. Peter became a Christian, an apostle, a mighty servant in the kingdom of our Lord. I don't know what else Andrew did, to be frank with you. But the simple act of bringing his brother to the Savior 
had such positive repercussions. You have a brother, a sister, a niece or nephew, a neighbor, a co-worker that you can introduce Jesus to. God is depending on you. And if you yearn for the salvation of souls, as Paul did, this will be your goal. And it can work. The church can grow. Success is, pos is possible. Uh, we can focus on the positive promises of Scripture. Do you know that John said, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world? That Paul exclaimed, thanks be to God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. Or we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. And I could go on and on. The positive message is when we give our hearts and lives to God and follow in the steps of Jesus, they will use us in powerful ways to save souls. We can't be defeatist, folks. We've got to be excited, enthused, optimistic about the gospel we have to share and the power that it possesses to change hearts and lives for the better. But it's not going to happen without effort. Real personal planning has to go into it. If you want to be a soul winner for Jesus, and surely if we're Christians we do, we have to prepare. We cannot teach what we do not know. No wonder the scriptures admonish, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth or handling it aright. Like the Bereans, we should search the scriptures daily to make sure that what we hear is so, and when we've confirmed the truth, we ought to have the desire to share it. And there needs to be patient persistence as well. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, it may have in fact been last week, I lose track of time, that in relationship to the gospel and the response of the gospel in Acts that by and large people heard and without delay obeyed. Most of them recorded in this wonderful book, heard one message and responded in obedience. And that's not typically the case these days, is it? In fact, people can be exposed to the truth over and over and over again and still not obey. But keep sowing the seed. Keep sharing the gospel. Per persistence really does pay. So be patient. Don't give up. Continue to reach out, live your faith, and share it with others. I want to close with the passage from Isaiah 55. I realize you're probably not going to be able to see the whole text on the board behind me. So I'll just read it for you if you'll follow along. These are the words of God communicated the prophet Isaiah for all of God's people. I want you to see the power in the message, not the messenger, but in the message. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, you know how life is. You know the value of rain and snow and how important moisture is for plants to grow and ultimately to produce. And God's the giver of that moisture. But that's not really the point. The point that God makes through Isaiah is this. So shall my word be that goeth out from me, or goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. You can have that same confidence about the gospel today. You sow the good seed, 
and when the soil's right, it will do its job every time. What we need to do is sow the seed. As Jesus would say, the fields are white unto harvest. Pray, therefore, the Lord of harvest to send forth reapers. That's you and me as we go forth from this place to help the church grow, to be the men and women God calls us to be. In a moment, we'll sing the song that Brad has selected. If you're not a Christian, you have the opportunity to begin a new life in Christ this evening by acting on your faith. We will take your confession from a penitent heart and in a short time immerse you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit for the remission of your sins, and God's gift of the Holy Spirit will be yours, and heaven, if you're faithful, will be your eternal home. Nothing else really matters. You miss out on heaven, you failed. And if heaven's your home, no matter what else this life held for you, you will have succeeded in the one area that matters most. If you're subject to his call, will you come as we stand and sing? So far from his presence come today, hear his loving voice all in still, calling now for thee, O oh, weary prodigal come, calling now for Tenderly still the Father pleads, hear, or oh, hear him calling, calling now for thee. O oh, return while the Spirit in mercy intercedes, hear his loving voice calling still. Call of thy father and to spare hear all hear him call thee calling now for thee lo the table is spread and the feast is waiting there hear his loving voice calling still calling now for thee Troy Oliver has come tonight expressing his desire to be baptized for the remission of his sins. Troy has been visiting our services uh, of late several times and we're delighted that he's made this decision. You're going to have the privilege of seeing a young man born into the family of God. There is nothing, absolutely nothing more exciting than the birth of a child of God. And it is a process clearly outlined in Scripture where the old man is buried in a watery grave and a new man is raised to walk in newness of life. Now a child of God, a 
Christian with heaven in his future. We commend Troy for his desire to put his Lord on in baptism, and we'll take care of that as soon as we can at this time. Go ahead and sing number 739. Number 739. <clears throat> I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. Decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the, <coughs> the world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back. No turning back. Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? No turning back. No turning back. <clears throat> Number 578. 578. When we walk with our Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt nor a fear, not a sigh nor a tear, can abide while we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no Jesus, but to trust and obey.
We'll do the first and last verse. Praise the Lord, ye heavens adore him. Praise him, angels in the high. Sun and moon rejoice before him. Praise him, all ye stars of light. Hallelujah, amen. 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 Praise the God of our salvation, host on high his power proclaim. Heaven and earth and all creation, <clears throat> Lord, and magnify his name. Hallelujah, amen, amen, amen. What a wonderful conclusion to a beautiful day. I thank Roger for two excellent lessons today. Uh, what a prophetic choice for this evening's message on growing the church and the perfect example we saw this evening. Some things to keep you in mind of. Uh, among those who are ill is Mary Lou Crumbly. She is in Selby undergoing uh, rehabilitation. We're still not certain whether Lloyd Westbrook is in the hospital or out of the hospital. He was out. He was back in. We're not sure if he's back out yet. He is at home. That's good. Uh, Esther Beal, that is Ed's mother, uh, was also in the hospital and is also now at home. We do extend our sympathy to the family of Penny Strawler. That's Laura Wilcoxon's sister. Memorial service will be Tuesday at 11 a.m. at Robert's Funeral Home. Visitation beginning at 10 until the time of service. A reminder that VBS Kids Day is coming up June 13th. Registration forms are available in the office. Uh, if you would like to pass out an invitation or a flyer to someone that uh, you'd like to encourage to come, those are available out in the lobby. I want to thank those who took a public part this evening, Brad for leading our singing, uh, Paul for reading our scripture. We invite you back at uh, any time you have to join us for services. A reminder, our next service will be Wednesday evening for Bible study at 7 p.m. And, of course, next Sunday, 9 a.m. is Bible study. 10 is our um, worship assembly. Uh, if you did not have an opportunity to partake of uh, communion this morning, it has been prepared and is available. During the singing of the last song, you can exit through the rear of the auditorium and take two rights, and you'll end up in the conference room. There will be men there waiting to serve you. Following that final song, uh, Greg Klein will lead our minds in a closing prayer. So, Brad. We'll go ahead and close out with number 206. Number 206. If you're able to, please stand with me. <clears throat> I am the vine, and ye are the branches. Bear precious fruit for Jesus today. Branches in him, no fruit ever bearing. Jesus has said he taketh away. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. I am the vine, be faithful and true. Ask what he will, your prayer shall be granted. The Father loved me, so I have loved you. Now ye are clean through words I have spoken. Living in me, much fruit ye shall bear. Dwelling in you, my promise unbroken. 
glory in heaven me ye shall share. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. I am the vine, he is faithful and true. Your prayer shall be granted. The Father loved me, so I have loved you. Yes, by your fruits the world is to know you. Walking in love as children of day. Follow your guide, he passeth before you. Leading to realms of glorious day. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. I am the vine, be faithful and true. Ask what ye will, your prayer shall be granted. The Father loved me, so I have loved you. Bow with me. Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the blessings of this day, thankful we're able to be out tonight. We pray that each one feels encouraged and blessed for having been here. Thankful that Troy has come forward and decided to follow you. Father, we ask that you be with each one of us, that we'll live our lives daily for you. The world around us will know we are yours. Help us to sow the seed that the kingdom may grow. We ask you to lead us away from temptations, and we ask your forgiveness for the times we failed you. We ask you to watch over us and keep us safe the remainder of this week, especially be with Harry and Matt as they travel, that they will gain knowledge and return safely to us. We are most thankful for Jesus, that he is our Savior, and we come to you in his name and prayer. Amen.